A couple of years back, I found myself on a solo hunting trip in South Texas. The sun dipped low in the sky as I settled into my deer blind, surrounded by the rustling leaves and distant calls of the wild. Little did I know that the tranquility of the moment was about to be shattered. As I peered through the camouflage of the blind, scanning the landscape for any sign of movement, my heart skipped a beat. In the distance, I spotted a group of figures navigating through the rugged terrain. Fear gripped me when I noticed a leader at the front carrying a rifle. It didn't take long to realize that these were Mexican immigrants crossing our property. Chilled by the stories I had heard about hunters in the same county facing robbery or worse at the hands of such groups, panic set in. The woods suddenly felt less like a sanctuary and more like a potential danger zone. I could almost hear the tales echoing in my mind as I contemplated the best course of action. I decided to hunker down, lowering myself onto the floor of the deer blind. The brush around me provided some cover, and I tried to make myself as inconspicuous as possible. My breaths became shallow, and every creak of the blind seemed deafening. The quietness of the forest was now an eerie symphony, each rustle making me flinch. Time seemed to crawl as I lay there, my senses on high alert. The distant footsteps drew nearer, and the leader's silhouette became clearer against the fading daylight. My pulse quickened, and beads of sweat formed on my forehead as I prayed they wouldn't come too close. I couldn't shake the feeling of vulnerability, a silent observer hidden among the trees. The fear of the unknown, fueled by the stories I had heard, made the experience all the more nerve-wracking. It was a test of my instincts, a battle between rationality and the primal fear that coursed through my veins. Eventually, the group passed by without incident. The weight of relief was palpable as I watched them disappear into the wilderness. I stayed put, allowing the echoes of their footsteps to fade before cautiously emerging from my hiding spot. I was walking out of the woods one night with my bow and my tree stand on my back. I kept hearing something walking behind me, and when I would stop, it would stop. I would start walking, and so would it. I kept turning around and looking with my flashlight, but couldn't see anything. I got freaked out and started running. It started running as well. I'm literally on the verge of having a heart attack when I realized it was my tree stand strap dragging the ground about 15 feet behind me. I was spear fishing at night with a pretty powerful flashlight when out of the dark came this foot long snake looking thing. Almost gave me a heart attack turned out to be a ragworm swimming towards my face. A couple of minutes later, another one came swimming at me. Ten minutes later, the water was full of these long suckers all around me in the dark. Creeped me out. Turned out it was mating season, which makes them leave their holes in the sand, swimming up to release their sperm by destroying their bodies, dying in the process. Torchlight must have been drawing them out as if it was the full moon or something. I'll be checking for ragworm mating season every time I'm planning to go spear fishing. Edit, people have been asking why I spear fish at night. Species are the same. Trout, flatfish, etc., but they're closer to the shore and more relaxed at night. In some countries, too many people take advantage of the fact that it's a bit easier to take the fish in the dark. This has led to spear fishers getting bad reputation. In many countries, spearfishing at night is illegal. So will it be in all of a you this year because some spearfishers without moral are taking too many fish in southern Europe? It's sad to see the sport being ruined by people just wanting money, not caring for nature. I only take the fish I can eat for myself and my family if I find any at all. So should anybody else. It's important to take care of the nature. Be responsible. Sash Lake, visiting from Wiltshire, reported that at 12.20 p.m., 
I was leading Drumna Drochiot on a coach, admiring the view while the coach was driving past the lock. It started to rain and a light fog rolled in. My view vision was partly limited due to the trees alongside the lock, but something caught my eye for approximately five seconds and made me jump out of my skin. I saw a huge black mass hump in the middle of the lock, roughly the size of a double-decker bus. I would say it was around seventy, five, one hundred yards away from me. I was confused and in disbelief. I jumped to my feet to get a better look. Trees completely blocked my view for about five. Eight seconds there was a clearing in the trees. And when I looked back to where I saw the black mass hump, there was nothing there. A few years ago, a good friend of ours was in a car severe accident in which the passenger was in critical condition, whom I didn't know, and the driver, who was our friend, was also in critical, but worse condition. Within the first twelve hours, our friend, whom I will refer to as Mary from here on out, died at the hospital. I'm unsure of the fate of the passengers, as I didn't know them, but I believe they did survive. Originally, the news of her death was brought up to me by another friend, and later confirmed it when I looked it up and saw it on a news web page stating her full first and last name, which I might add is not a common last name at all. But don't feel comfortable disclosing here. Circumstances of the accident and location of the accident. After a couple of days of checking for an obituary to get funeral details, I eventually saw it around day two or three. But unfortunately, it said the family wished to have a private funeral open only to relatives. Death wasn't a new thing to me, as I unfortunately already had a few friends pass by at this point in time, but it was pretty unsettling not being able to say my final goodbyes at a funeral, as is usually the norm. Fast forward about three, four months or so, I'm going about my daily routine and coming up to a four-way stop sign at nearly the same time as another car. The other car pulled up to the stop sign at the road perpendicular to my right. I remember this so vividly and will never forget it. Knowing a car was there, I probably glanced at my phone for a second to let them go ahead, and some loud screaming caught my ear over the sound of the radio. I blow it off for a second, but it continues in increased frequency. I look over real quick, look forward again, and then it crosses my mind. No way in hell, and I look back over again. And damn if it isn't Mary leaning out her window of that other car, waving her arms all around, screaming my name, trying to get my attention. The weirdest chill and feeling came over my body, literally as if I'm seeing a ghost and questioning my sanity on whether I was seeing things. At this point, I yelled out the window to tell her to turn right and pull over on the first street, which was within eyesight. I get out of the car and literally am stuttering and don't have the first clue of what to say, and she just decides at that point to lean in and give me a hug. She was solid, and I could feel her hugging me, so at that point I was assured that she wasn't a ghost lol. I explained to her how I'd grieved over her death and how I saw her obituary and everything, and she thought I was half crazy. I wish I could explain the way it feels to see somebody you knew was dead for a few months and then be able to hug them and have a chat in the most unexpected way possible. But I don't even know if there is a word in the English language to describe it. Now where it gets really interesting is after sharing all the details I knew of her passing an accident, everything matched up minus the death part. But I vividly remember seeing the obituary in the news article with her name and all the details of the accident that I explained to her. She actually did get in a terrible accident and was just released from the hospital a couple weeks before I saw her after she spent a couple months in the hospital. The exact road and location I told her were the correct spots, too. The first 30 days she was in the hospital, she was in a coma and had a rough recovery and many surgeries following that, so it wasn't minor by any means. Later that day, I tried finding the obituary and news article, but they were nowhere to be found. But where did I get all the info from? 
This has been weird for a while, but for the longest time I blew it off as someone with the same name in a similar location. But I can't find anything on that either. The likelihood of someone with her exact unusual name is highly unlikely too. Not sure if this was a glitch or if I shifted timelines. As an ex-Navy SEAL operative, I have one interesting story for your channel. So, we had been sent deep into enemy territory, a remote village in Kosovo, on a daring rescue mission. Our objective was to recover a missing team of American translators who had been captured by Serbian paramilitary forces. As a Navy SEAL team, we were accustomed to dangerous missions, but this one had an air of unpredictability, a sense that something darker lurked in the shadows of that war-torn village. The approach to the village was tense. We made contact with the Serbian paramilitary group that held the hostages engaging in delicate negotiations. After hours of back and forth, we managed to secure the release of one of the missing men. The relief on his face was palpable as we led him to safety. Our team began the return journey, our rescue mission seemingly successful. But as we ventured deeper into the unforgiving terrain, a feeling of unease began to grip us. The sense of being watched hung in the air, and the forest seemed to close in around us. It was then that our calm, methodical exit was disrupted by an unforeseen and otherworldly terror. The creature that emerged from the shadows defied explanation and struck fear into the hearts of battle, hardened seals. It was unlike anything we had ever encountered. Towering at nearly eight feet tall, its body was a grotesque fusion of human and something far more sinister. Bulging muscular arms terminated in clawed hands, each digit tipped with razor-sharp talons. Its skin was ashen and mottled, stretched tightly over its muscular frame. In place of eyes, it had hollow, glowing pits that radiated an unnatural crimson hue. The creature's elongated fangs protruded from its mouth, dripping with a dark, viscous substance. Its legs were powerful and agile, allowing it to move with unsettling grace. As it approached us, a guttural, otherworldly growl emanated from its chest, sending shivers down our spine. The fierce battle ensued, with our SEAL team fighting for our lives against this supernatural adversary. The creature moved with incredible speed and strength, making it a formidable opponent. We fired round after round, and the creature let out spine, chilling screeches as bullets found their mark. Despite our relentless assault, the creature's unnatural vitality and regenerative abilities allowed it to escape, disappearing into the darkness from whence it came. We returned to our base, our hearts still pounding with the intensity of the encounter. We reported the inexplicable events to our general, hoping for answers. But he was skeptical, dismissing our accounts as the result of combat fatigue or stress. We couldn't blame him. What we had witnessed defied all reason and logic. As we sat in the briefing room, the memory of that night in the Kosovo village haunted us. We knew what we had seen, and we were left with more questions than answers. I don't usually hike, but my friend, whom we'll call Desmond, hikes 24-7, especially at night. I remember one day he invited me for late, night camping. Basically, we hiked in the woods, and he wanted to go up a mountain. Even today, I ask why the heck I agreed to this. I've been in nature a lot to understand that something was awfully wrong with that forest. No animal sounds, and no sounds of bugs. Absolutely nothing. Not even mosquitoes, to let you understand. For a good forty minutes it was peaceful until we got to the other side of the mountain. I remember Desmond telling me, Hey, do you see houses down there? Now, thankfully, I've got good eyes and saw what seemed to be seven abandoned houses circling each other. Desmond said to me, Wanna go check it out? Of course, being cautious as ever, I said no. But he started calling me a scaredy, cat for not saying yes. Finally, I gave in, and we went to check it out. 
Moments later, when we approached the houses, somehow it was very quiet, too quiet, to be honest. I told Desmond to get out of there because this place was too suspicious, and he told me that there was no way a human could live here. But that's when we heard footsteps from the woods, heavy yet slow footsteps. We went to hide behind some bushes, and what we saw was a woman with a lantern walking around and sobbing as if she had lost someone. I saw, though, that she was holding a knife in her left hand and was chanting something. I kind of heard her saying two things, curse them and their children. While I was extremely frightened, Desmond seemed even more scared than me, which surprised me since he is braver than all my friends. We sneaked our way out of there, but when we got back across the mountain to go to our car, we saw the same woman behind us, only without the lantern, and she started chasing us with her knife and what seemed like a hatchet in her other hand. We ran like there was no tomorrow, and her screams filled us with more fear, making us run even faster. Once we reached the car, we left the woods. By now, the sun was rising, and we finally got to town. What I'll never forget, though, is that we had stopped at a store to get some drinks, and I said that I'd wait outside for a bit. I saw a poster on a street lamp. It was the face of that woman on it, and the poster said missing. A couple of friends and I were born in December when I decided we should take a walk through the woods behind my house. I didn't think much of it as my friends and I had done it many times before. There were four of us, and we set out at about 11 o'clock at night. It was rather dark, but there was some light from the moon. The weather was quite cold since we did this in the winter. The area we walked on consisted of game trails, which moose typically used, as well as trails for mushers, runners, and cross-country skiers. We had walked about two miles from my house to another entrance, where most people usually enter. On the way, we talked about unexplainable events and things like Bigfoot or UFOs. When we reached the bridge where most people entered, one friend smoked a cigarette. It was then that we saw a light and decided to move on. On the way back, we heard a wild dog barking frantically and decided to pick up the pace. It eventually turned into a sprint. While we walked, we continued talking about it, and it was then that I realized something had been following us, testing us, or even harassing us. This had started much earlier, but I hadn't thought much about it. I initially thought it was my friend Warren, who is sometimes clumsy, making noises like slipping, but it turned out to be something throwing things at us. I realized this about halfway back. I asked if Warren kept slipping and he told me he wasn't thinking I might be playing a prank on him. We stopped for a minute to listen, and I told the others that something strange was happening. We shone a flashlight around, hearing noises like footsteps and branches moving and breaking. The leader thought I might be playing a joke, but when I assured him I wasn't, he decided to walk behind me. That's when something threw snowballs at us, nearly hitting us on several occasions. It was then that he realized this was no joke, and we picked up a light jog for most of the way. When we were almost out of the woods, we heard dogs again, maybe 20 feet away, branches breaking and something throwing stuff at us. By the time we left, it was about 3 to 3.30 in the morning. I didn't go directly to my house because I didn't know if it was still following us. I knew it was not a prank because the snow in the woods was more than five feet deep, making it extremely challenging for someone to play a prank like that. This happened in February of 2004, up near the power line clearings east of Potter Marsh outside of Anchorage. Two of my friends and I were bored one night, so we decided to do a little snow machining. Even though it was generally believed to be illegal to snow machine in Anchorage, there were some good trails to ride on a little north of my house. We set off at around 11 p.m., riding for about a quarter of a mile before cutting onto the trails. There had been about 10 inches of fresh snowfall a few days prior, so there were no tracks on the trails. I was leading the way for about half an hour, and then we stopped and talked for a little bit. After our break, we took off again, 
continuing to cruise along some kind of game trail that led to an opening in the wood. I rode into the opening with my friends following about fifty yards behind me. As I came over a small mound, I saw strange tracks leading to a spot in the snow where it looked like something had pushed aside some snow and laid down. Initially, I thought it might be a moose or something, but I followed the tracks over the next small hill. As I came down the far side, my headlight pointed directly at the back of a Bigfoot, which was only about 10 to 12 feet in front of me. It was running in the opposite direction, and I slammed on the brakes because I was terrified. The creature continued to run away, leaping over a dead log covered in snow, and then it disappeared into a group of trees, vanishing into the darkness. I was so surprised and scared that I quickly turned around and rode back towards my friends. I met them back by the first mound and told them we need to get out of here, and we rode back toward my house. When I shared the experience with my friends near my house, they laughed and suggested it was probably a bear or someone in the woods. However, I was 100% certain that it was neither a bear nor anything else. The way it ran through the deep snow left me convinced it wasn't anything human. For a long time, I was made fun of, and everyone told me I was crazy, so I, I don't like talking about it. I'm sharing the story because I was forced to sit through it during New Year's Eve dinner, and I'm so freaked out and goddamn itchy that I need to get it out of my system. I'm sure some of you are going to breeze on by this little tantrum here and go right to the meat of the story because you're thinking, hey, I've got a strong stomach. Well, go for it. Boring stuff out of the way. He was drafted, and since he was short and skinny, he was a perfect tunnel wreck. Those were the guys who wriggled their way through the ridiculously narrow tunnels the Viet Cong used to transport personnel and weapons, set booby traps and all that. And when I say narrow, I mean narrow. So Gramps was wriggling around in a tunnel one day, and a few bad things happened. First, the two other people with him got killed by a solitary VC while they were standing around the hole. Being a few feet underground and about 20 feet through meant Grandpa couldn't see who attacked them, or know if anyone survived. He later learned he was the only one left alive, but he assumed the VC attacker would soon start throwing grenades into the tunnel, and he'd be done for. After a few minutes with no sign of any incoming attack, Grandpa breathed a sigh of relief and started moving forward again. A little while later, though, it started pouring rain. The tunnel began to fill with water. Now, in an unfinished, unsupported tunnel like he was in, a rainstorm usually meant death for a tunnel rat. He'd heard horror stories from the squad mates who'd lost others underground, never to be seen again. He figured he'd be another, but he wasn't going to go out without a fight. He crawled forward. With him, he carried a small pistol and a Fulton flashlight. Originally, he'd been sent down to ambush some VC soldiers who were thought to be hidden in one of the tunnel's larger chambers. He'd crawl through, surprise them, blow their brains out, and wiggle his way back out. At least, that's how his first three tunnel trips had gone. This one, his fourth, wasn't going so well. The tunnel narrowed as he crawled. Ahead of him, he heard rushing water. He thought it might mean the main chamber was nearby. He was wrong. The sound was the muddy ground above him, sloshing downward, sealing the tunnel ahead. This is where he started to panic. He knew he wasn't particularly deep in the ground, maybe two and a half feet, but if he didn't start clawing upward through the ground really, really fast, he'd be a dead man. So he clawed. His fingernails tore off and his hands got cut up really bad, but he was able to get part of his arm and face out of the mud. He was unable to move any farther. His lower back was pushed hard into the dirt, and the angle had him bent into an elongated U-shape. His legs were trapped. Above him, a square foot of light shone through where he'd escape if he weren't stuck. He knew if it started to storm again, he'd drown. But the rain didn't come. Insects did. Ants were first. Luckily, they weren't the big red ones everyone over there was terrified of. The ones with a bite that felt like you got shot. These were tiny black ones, but there were lots of them. 
He assumed when the tunnel flooded, they were driven from their homes. Now they crawled over his scalp, face, and neck. They didn't bite, but they tickled and itched. Those which found their way onto his lips were licked off and swallowed. He figured he'd be going a while without food. After a while, the ants lost interest. Flies became a problem, though. To see why, you need to know the position in which he was stuck. The twisted, awkward angle of his body left one arm stretched out in front of him, but his shoulder and upper back were immobile. So he had a bit of movement in his upper arm, wrist, and hand, but anything below his elbow might as well have been paralyzed. Why is this relevant? Because his armpit was exposed. Not by much, maybe an inch of clearance, but that was more than enough for the flies, and they were very, very attracted to the warm, moist pit. Over the course of an hour, twenty to thirty fat, brownish-black flies dove into his right armpit. They stayed for a little while, usually no more than six or seven at a time, before they flew away. Of course, while inside, they bit. The pain was sharp and awful, he said. It reminded him of that deep, pinching itch of the horse flies on the beach near where he grew up, and he couldn't stop them from doing anything. He just ground his teeth. As the sun went down, the flies started to lose interest and flew away. He knew a few stayed nestled inside because he felt them moving against the thick hair of his armpit, but the majority had gone. Now just mosquitoes remained to torment him with their endless bites and bottomless gullets. Somehow he slept. From the moment the sun came up, new insects visited him. Of all the massive tropical bugs he'd seen in Vietnam, he was grateful to have so far avoided the giant centipedes he'd heard about. Massive, angry things as long as a man's forearm and as thick as a bottle of beer. One of his more sadistic squad mates hid one in the bunk of another, poor bastard. It bit his feet and toes ten times before he could even jerk himself out of the bed. Grandpa hated even the tiny ones that he sometimes found in his basement back home, so the thought of those big ones made his blood run cold. God help you. Five minutes after he opened his eyes to the morning light, one of them crawled onto his hand and wrapped itself around his wrist. He was too horrified to move. The little movement he had in his hand and wrist might have been enough to fling it away, but he didn't want to take a chance. So he waited. Apparently, the thing liked Grandpa because it remained on him for well over an hour before Grandpa couldn't take the stress anymore. He tried to grab the bug in his fist. The moment he started moving, the thing began to bite. Grandpa was able to get a good grip on it and squeezed as hard as he could. The centipede broke in half in his hand and sent disgusting juices down his arm. The two pieces of its body dropped into the hole. The front part still had some life in it, and as it died, it bit Grandpa on the nose and lips until he was forced to take its head in his teeth and kill it. He described a taste to us, but I'm just not going to write it out. Yeah, it was that awful. The rest of that day was spent suffering as flies swarmed around the carcass of the centipede. They couldn't get enough of it. For long hours, he watched them eat and shit and fall over the monstrous bug. The juice on his arm, too, which had dribbled all the way down into his armpit, was also like the nectar of the gods for the flies. More and more of them flew in and out of his armpit. He could tell more were staying within its moist confines, too. The pinching and itching and tickling sensations were occasionally more torturous than the nastily swollen centipede bites. Ants, too, noticed the centipede corpse. This time, the little black ones weren't the only variant. The red monsters with the hideous jaws had arrived. Grandpa lucked out, though. They were more interested in killing the smaller ants than bothering him. He did say one of them bit the corner of his left eye, but the pain was much less than what the pussies at camp were always bitching about. It was here my cousin told him that he missed his calling as a gender studies professor to which Grandpa simply replied by slapping him on the side of the head and saying, I don't appreciate jokes about that field of study. What a complex man. Anyway, back in hell it had started to rain. This was a mixed blessing for Grandpa. The majority of bugs scurried away to find higher ground, but he was fairly certain the hole was going to fill with water and he'd drown. 
Well, it didn't, and he didn't. He even got a chance to drink some rainwater. He'd been without any real food or water for well over 24 hours at that point, so he was grateful to swallow the few tablespoons Worthy managed to get. There was a scary moment when the dirt below his hips shifted downward, and he thought he was going to fall and get buried. Again, he lucked out. The shift was minor. He'd been pinned in that strange elongated. U shaped for a while, and having a tiny bit of the pressure relieved around his groin was definitely a plus. He was able to wiggle his hips and butt a little and figured there was maybe an inch or two of clearance in that area, but nothing that allowed him to get any hope of crawling out. He drifted to sleep at dusk and was woken up before dawn by severe pain in his armpit. He'd known all along that flies were busy damaging his skin and probably eating it. He was resigned to that fact. As long as it wasn't another centipede, he wasn't going to complain. But this pain was new, and it was exquisite. The bites came much more frequently, and he felt a lot of them moving around. That pain, despite its severity, was dwarfed by what came next. Let me just make this known. I don't want to tell this part of the story. Just thinking about it makes me cringe. But God damn it, it's essential to his experience. And I'm sorry in advance for you having to read it. I'll try to make it quick. The shifting downward of the dirt was the result of an ant colony collapsing, a big one. All the ants came up out of the wreckage and had been hanging out on the surface of the dirt right below Grandpa's hips. But as he started to settle into the new position overnight, the ants became agitated and swarmed him. And by him, I mean his crotch. Maybe the only thing that equaled the level of horror at the table as he talked about ants crawling into his penis and rectum was how hard my grandmother laughed as he told it. You've got to get really close to see the scars, she exclaimed as tears of laughter ran down her cheeks. My brother Derek's new girlfriend turned green and left the table with Derek hurrying after her. Grandma and Grandpa shared a kiss and he continued with the story. With ants up his dick and asshole and flyers building a housing project in his armpit, Grandpa suffered through the next two days in a haze of pain and fear. The lack of food and water had taken a toll on him. This, he told us, was somewhat helpful. The pain grew less acute as his consciousness waxed and waned. A tarantula wandered into the hole, and Grandpa was able to bite its abdomen in half and suck out what was inside. This, of course attracted more flies, but there was nothing he could do about it. If he didn't get some food and water in him, he'd die. His survival instinct was still intact, despite the all the trauma. A couple more days went by, and he blurrily realized he'd been stuck for about a week. The rainfalls and insect pulp had kept him hydrated just enough to stay alive. His armpit was numb, all the way down to the last rib on his right side. Flies were ignoring everything else and just going straight in and out of the pit. The adventurous ants had lost interest after a while, but every so often he felt a nasty pinch on one incredibly sensitive area or another. More time passed. Late one afternoon and he heard gunfire. He'd heard quite a bit while he was stuck, but it was always off in the distance and too far for him to get any hope that he'd be rescued. This time, though, it was very close. He was overwhelmed with a sense of hope, which was tainted by the concern that he'd be found by the wrong side. But, to his astonishment, it wasn't the V.C. who he heard shouting after all the gunfire. Grandpa started waving his arm with the tiny bit of movement he could muster. He heard someone yell, Hey, there's an arm over here. Grandpa yelled back incoherently and was soon greeted by the sight of a U.S. soldier peering down at him. It took him and his squad mates ten minutes to dig Grandpa out of the hole. He remembers all of them saying some variant of holy shit after they'd freed him. Someone radioed their position, and after some unknown amount of time, a helicopter landed in a nearby clearing. Grandpa was loaded onto a stretcher, and they lifted off. A medic who was along for the ride cut off Grandpa's shirt and promptly threw up. When the rest of the soldiers and the chopper looked at what the medic had seen, a few of them also rained puke down from the side of the aircraft. A few days after being rescued, Grandpa woke up in a hospital. Not one on the base either, one in the United States. 
He had no idea how he got there. Once he was rescued, he passed out and slept for almost 36 straight hours. Some people thought he was in a coma until some poor medic tried to wake him up, and Grandpa said to F off and knock the guy out with a single shot to the chin. Now awake, the doctors told Grandpa the extent of his injuries. Aside from the severe dehydration, he was absolutely riddled with infected bites. The ones on his more sensitive areas weren't much cause for alarm, despite their unpleasantness. It was the bigger bites that were much more of a concern. The one from the red ant was the worst, and for a while the doctors worried he'd lose the eye. His lips and nose had terrible swelling from the infected centipede bites. Even though all those bites were awful, he could have recovered in a few weeks and would have been back in the tunnel soon after but his armpit was why he was sent home. Botflies are a type of insect which lay their eggs inside flesh. Until Grandpa's experience, no one knew they even had them in Vietnam, but apparently they do. The underside of his right arm all the way down to nearly his hip was completely reshaped into horrible. Cavities for your larvae. The doctors wouldn't operate, saying the only way to excise them was to let them gestate and at a certain point suffocate them with adhesive tape so they'd crawl to the surface. It took another few weeks, but that's what happened. Grandpa regaled us with the story of how he personally gave birth to three one-three botfly larvae. Then he lifted up his shirt to show us the pockmarked skin. No one said much after that. He was done with the story, and after shoveling a slice of fruitcake into his mouth, he and Grandma left. They laughed all the way to the door. I don't really know what else to say. So, yeah, that's Grandpa. Happy New Year. This happened about eight years ago. To this day, I keep wondering what happened to come across my sister. It was wintertime here in the suburbs of northern Virginia. I live with my family in a neighborhood not far from Washington, D.C., Dale City, so it's not to say we're in the middle of nowhere. Although our home is very close to a few decently large wooded parks. One night I was at my then-girlfriend's place up near the city. I got a phone call from my sister around 7 p.m., which in wintertime makes it pretty much nighttime here. I didn't think anything of it. Usually she calls me for random things she needs my insight on. A bit about my sister. Ever since she was little, she loved horror movies. Growing up with her, I can tell you firsthand that she isn't easily scared. She loves the paranormal. All right, so back to the call. I picked up the phone, and the first thing I realized was her voice breaking up. She was sobbing and could barely talk clearly. Instantly, my mind started rushing with horrible thoughts about what could have happened. She kept telling me to come home as soon as possible. I asked her why. Is everything okay? She wouldn't say. She just kept asking me to come home. Obviously, I got in my car and rushed home. The neighborhood is very dim. There aren't many lights. Only a few solar-powered garden lamps from surrounding homes. As soon as I got home, I ran inside and asked her again what happened. And she finally started explaining. About half an hour before she called me, she went outside to grab a few things from her car. Again, it was dark out, but when the car was unlocked, the headlights turned on. When she opened the door to the car, the light was shining from the driveway to the roof of the garage. She noticed it first from inside the car. A short, bipedal, human-looking thing standing on two jet-black muscular legs. At first, she said she thought it was a raccoon, but this would have been obvious to her. But this thing scared her to the point of crying while she was in the car. Her view was obstructed by the rest of the creature, which was crouching, and from what she described, it was scratching at something on the roof, trying to get in. Maybe, but she wasn't going to stick around to find out. She got out of the car, pretending to not have spotted it. This thing, it acted in a seemingly intelligent way. She thought, maybe if I act as if I didn't see it, it will just stay up there and not try to attack or anything, but as she walked behind the car, she heard it stand upright. Startled, she looked directly at it. The whole description, she told me, was as follows. 
jet black, smooth dolphin skin like legs and arms. Five digit hands and no claws. Dreadful looking, very dirty fur or hair covering its head or body. The face is what was disturbing. The face had two shining yellow eyes that glowed from the car's headlights. No nose, just two slits, and a very wide mouth with no lips. She took off when she made eye contact. As soon as she was indoors, she called 911 and an officer was dispatched to our house. He looked around back and tried to see if there was any damage or sign of someone climbing the roof. No footprints, no damage. It was all in place. The officer just told us to lock the doors and windows and left. It's not like my sister to be terrified to the point of calling. The police. Whatever this thing was, though, I can only imagine what it was actually like to witness something like it in real life. To this day, both I and her get extremely uneasy arriving home after dark. So recently, my boyfriend of two years has told me a handful of times while I'm talking to him that my face changes. I know this because I'll be in the middle of a sentence, and he will look at me very strange, like I'm something else, and I will ask him what's wrong. In the past, I've made close friends, and usually the people who are more spiritual will notice right away and tell me, but they can never describe it. I can remember at least five other individuals who have told me the same thing. Whenever I get close to someone on a more spiritual level, they all see someone else while looking at me in deep conversation or feeling towards each other. One person in particular who spoke Latin and practiced rituals kicked me out while hanging out because it freaked him out. He called me Lilith and said I'm attached to something more. My boyfriend is not spiritual in any way, but when he's deep in his fields, it happens. Anyone else here like me? Anyone know what this could possibly be about? I am half Mexican, and in recent years, my mother and I have started participating in the Dada de Muertos tradition by creating our Vrinda and hanging photos of relatives who have passed. This morning, my mom asked me what time I came home the night before, and I said it was 11.40 p.m. She mentioned that our security camera reported someone at the door or someone unlocking the door at 3.33 a.m. and showed me the report on the security app. A few minutes later, the report disappeared as if it had never popped up. My mom is quite spiritual and believes it could be an ancestor visiting our house. I personally am skeptical but open to spirituality, so I wanted some input. So me and my family bought our house back in 2000. We were the first to live there and moved in after the house was built. The only explanations we have is that the clothing these ghosts wear are like early 1900, late 1800, and you'll know why. The first ghost made herself known when I was 12, 14. I always had trouble sleeping at night and couldn't walk around my house at night as I felt like someone was always watching, but I always just thought that was irrational kid thinking. Or so I thought. One night I was laying on my bed, not to sleep, but on top of my comforter and all. I was just staring out my bedroom door into the hallway. The hallway light and bedroom light was on and being in the second floor. I think I also had on the main entrance light on Think of a Chandelier, where the entrance you can see the stairs right away and see a bit upstairs as well. I had no music or anything playing when I hear a little girl's laugh just as all the lights turn off and my door closes shut. I freaked out and started screaming when my mom came out of her room on the first floor, thinking I was playing with the lights. She didn't believe my explanation that night, but I'll come back to this. The second ghost made himself known in a more creepier way. One night when I was 15, 16, I woke up at exactly 3.14. I felt something tap my shoulder, and as I turned to see what it was, a man stood next to my bed. 
He appeared to be in his late forties, early fifties, judging from his white hair and white mustache or beard in what I could only describe as Civil War uniform for the Confederacy. Only thing was his skin was very pale and his eyes had no pupils. I wanted to scream, but he only moved his finger over his lips to signify be quiet or shush. I laid in my bed, frozen with fear, as he walked out of my room and closing the door quietly. From that night, I kept hearing him match in my upstairs hallway. Now, being I was the only one that could account these spirits, I always was told I was crazy, until my brother and mom both told me they noticed the girl. She never did anything harmful except she loves to play with us by hiding things. Somewhere we know we didn't leave them as well as returning them to where they were originally after we look everywhere. Main things are keys, remotes, and small objects like nail polish or makeup. It's gotten to the point where if we lose something, and we know it's not where we left it, we just say, little girl, we need this back. Or little girl, we are in a rush and can't play. She'll normally put it back in its place a bit quicker. The older man was seen by my grandfather and my mom as well. My grandfather just saw him walk in the front door and directly to my parents' room. My mom would see him at night, but all he does is tip his hat to her and walks away. One night where she was crying a lot, I believe it was over losing her grandparents or her brother. He sat next to her and put his hand on her shoulder. She said he felt very cold, but she felt safe. Not sure if this means anything, but I thought it would be cool to share this with you all. Not sure if I really meet the criteria since I don't dive for work, but I dive wrecks up in the northeast United States, and most of our wrecks are. Real wrecks. I, uh... Not artificial reefs or purpose sunk wrecks. It's always sort of, not sure how to put it, chilling, eerie, to dive on what is basically a huge disaster site. Some wrecks are pretty much intact, relatively speaking, and others have been flattened out and are just fields of rubble. The war wrecks in particular are pretty interesting to dive on. You can sort of make your way around them, and after a while you can start to or I think you can start to piece together what happened. Oh, here's a massive hole ripped in the hull, big cracks running vertically. Maybe this is where the torpedo impacted over here is just corrosion or storm damage from being underwater for decades. Sometimes you'll see personal effects sitting on the outside of the wrecks in the sand, things like boots, musical instruments, that sort of thing. As far as the strangest or creepiest thing I've ever seen, it was actually at the bottom of a quarry. I went into the deepest part of the quarry. I IRC, it was around 100, and the bottom appeared to be completely flat, with the occasional pile of goose shit here and there. Getting closer to the bottom, you saw that there were actually what appeared to be tiny worms writhing all over the bottoms, completely blanketing the entire area like a little boiling sea of worms everywhere. Sometimes on night dives, you'll get surprised by a curious animal. All of a sudden, you look to your right, and there's just a big eye or pair of eyes staring at you as you shine your light over there, and you get a second or two to see what it is before it darts away, typically squid, less often fish. I guess my last one was one time I was diving in the vicinity of where a company was testing underwater drones, and sometimes you can hear them in the water with you. I was 17 and working as a hostess at Red Lobster just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm not going to give an exact location. Anyway, we were pretty dead a couple of hours before closing time. It was a snowy weeknight. I'm the only one up at the host stand. In walks three individuals. An older woman, I'd say, maybe late thirties. An older man, maybe the same age as the woman. And a young man. All are very tall. All with the same hair color. Really light blonde. They had the same facial features, and each had very deep blue eyes. 
All were wearing pretty much the same thing. Unremarkable, but clean black clothes. It sounds crazy trying to explain how weird this was. But they looked like clones with different genders and slightly different ages. They had not a blemish, not a wrinkle or hair out of place. And they all had the exact same facial expression, kind of smiling politely. But I swear it felt like they were looking into my soul. For some reason, I totally froze in shock. I guess maybe I could sense something was weird. Anyway, after standing there in shock for her, I don't know how long, I stuttered. Hello? They didn't respond. Just kept the same facial expression. I grabbed menus and gestured for them to follow me. They did. I seated them and told them their server would be with them shortly. They kept the same expression, and as I turned to walk away, all turned their heads in the same way at the same time to watch me. I know it probably sounds like nothing, but I swear it was so freaking weird. I came home and told my mom about it, and she told me about a time when she was working her first job at 16 at McDonald's. It was the closing shift, and the only customer there was a tall, pale man with white blonde hair, just like the people I saw, except his hair was long. She said he came up to the counter and smiled at her, just smiled. He didn't say a word, but clicked his extremely long fingernails on the counter. She kept asking him what she could get for him until she finally got creeped out enough to go in the back. Have you ever heard of anyone who had an experience like this or have any idea what the hell this was? I know in my bones they were not normal humans. I grew up in the Kettle Moraine State Forest in southern Wisconsin. I would constantly ride at TVs and dirt bikes on the south end of Whitewater Lake, a place called Natureland Park. This is a section of the Kettle Moraine that has 122 acres of trails and wilderness for people to enjoy. It borders the south end of Whitewater Lake. The trails are fairly well used during the summer, but not ever packed with people. When I was younger, some friends and I would run around Natureland Park doing what dumbass kids do. Just for the record, I lived about 18 minutes from Bray Road, the supposed home of the Beast of Bray Road. Anyway, some friends and I were running around the trails of Natureland Park back in the day, probably about eight of us or so. We heard something breaking branches off the trail, not too far from us. We all stopped to listen. There are no bears, no cats, nothing too scary around here. Maybe the occasional coyote, white tail, raccoon, etc. But whatever this was had to be large. So we all got a bit concerned. This thing must have moved because we heard a large snap of a branch. We took off running like a bunch of lunatics. We could hear this thing running behind us. It was literally like something out of a movie. My friend trips and falls as we're trying to catch up with the rest of our friends who had left us in the dust. As I stopped to help the other kid, we both looked back down the trail to see the silhouette of something enormous standing in the trail and staring at us. I couldn't make out any detail. It was just a massive black mass of something that looked like it wanted to dismember us. I yelled, What the F is that? Just about the same time, this thing dropped down on all fours and bolted off through the timber like a freight train. We got the F out of there as quick as we could. We could hear the thing busting through the woods, getting farther and farther off from us. As we got to the parking lot, everyone around us heard the commotion. We got on our bikes and rode like crazy all the way back home. It's not too much of an encounter, but it was enough for me to never go back to Natureland Park at night ever again. This all happened about 35 years ago, and I've only told a handful of people. I actually feel a bit better getting this out. Not too much happens around the small town. In 1995, on a quiet mid-morning in Sudak, Crimea, I, a local resident named Georgie, decided to take a stroll to the Black Sea Embankment to enjoy the refreshing sea breeze. With a goblet of beer in hand, I made my way down to the sandy shore, gazing at the tranquil horizon. The day was calm and remarkably beautiful. 
All of a sudden, an unexpected and eerie incident unfolded. Something sneaked up from behind and placed a rubber mask on my head. Startled, I instinctively reached for the mask under my chin and pulled it off, thinking it was just a bizarre prank. But in the blink of an eye, I found myself in an immense hall, completely disoriented. There was no sign of the sea, the beach, or the sky. Instead, the walls were lined with colossal screens and an array of mysterious control panels adorned with buttons. In front of these panels, there were oddly shaped chairs. When I looked down, I realized I was holding a rubber mask that resembled a blue reptilian monster with skin resembling that of a lizard covered in warts. Suddenly, a door in the wall slid open, and three monsters entered the room. These creatures bore a striking resemblance to the face on the mask I had been holding. They were tall, standing at about two meters, with bluish skin and an abundance of warts covering their entire bodies. They were completely unclothed and had an awful appearance. One of them approached me, placing his hand on my shoulder. This alien had three enormous curved claw-like fingers on his hand, and he spoke in a low, hoarse voice, revealing his large yellow fangs as he said, Homo sapiens. Terrified and overwhelmed by panic, I began to scream. Recoil dropped the mask to the floor and fled from the room. I entered a corridor filled with numerous oval doors, strange screens, and unrecognizable instruments. Driven by fear, I burst into another room where I encountered another blue reptilian humanoid. This being stretched his colossal arms outward and asked, Where are you running to? He then touched something on the wall, revealing what I can only describe as an abyss, an endless expanse of space with stars and breathtaking cosmic vistas. Trembling with fear, I watched as one of the blue reptilians approached me, took my hand and comforted me with the words, Do not be afraid. He guided me to the next room. In that room I witnessed a sight that defied all reason. Hundreds of reptilian humanoids standing in precise formation, shoulder to shoulder, all fixing their gaze upon me. Suddenly they parted ranks, revealing a stunning, completely nude woman with light hair, peacefully asleep on a small saw. I observed her for a few moments before the blue reptilians closed their ranks once more, obscuring her from view. The alien who had been my guide then led me to a screen displaying stars. With his clawed finger, he pointed at one particular star and declared Earth. Afterward, he embraced me with his powerful three-fingered hands and uttered a cryptic statement. Stay with us. We have no time in death. Terrified beyond words, I could only manage to express my desire to return home, emphasizing that my mother was anxiously awaiting my return. I pleaded with them to allow me to leave. The alien responded, Is there anything you wish to know? At that moment, I could think of only one question. How long will my mother live? The alien replied, As long as your current age. Following this exchange, the star on the screen rapidly approached, eventually resembling the Earth's globe, complete with its swirling clouds. Suddenly I found myself standing near my house, but facing in the opposite direction from where I had originally left. Astonishingly, I had been gone for five hours. I noticed a peculiar detail. The coins in my pocket emitted a faint yellowish glow when I took them out, a phenomenon that disappeared by morning. All right, first off, this isn't my story. I found a phone out in the woods near my house. They have been bulldozing and taking down trees to build new houses, and I like to walk around and see what they've done. I do not know the woman that posted this or what her Reddit handle was, but I know that she wanted it up here because she believed we were the only people that would believe her. Her phone was pretty banged up, and has absolutely no service. I figured this was the least I could do for her. From here on, these are the words of a Mrs. Helena White. October 9th, 2013. My name is Helena White. I am 36-year-old female from Kentucky, which is where I currently am. I need someone to see this. Though by the time you do, I will already be dead. 
I don't have internet access here, just my cell phone that's dying and has 100% no service. I have scheduled this to upload to Reddit, where people actually believe the weird things we all have to say to each other. If anyone ever finds it, everyone there has an open mind and can at least know the truth. I have also scheduled one to go to the police station, but they will never find me. The best they can do is give my family the news. I feel terrible for my mother, that she will never know what happened, never have a body to bury, never have closure. No one I know will, but at least they will know that I am gone. It's better this way, believe me. If they knew the truth, they would never sleep again, and no doubt they would hunt for me. Again, though, they will never find me. I will be dead, just not gone. I know you all on Reddit have heard some seriously crazy shit. I mean, I read about the girl that found that weird creature or house thing in the woods right here in Kentucky a couple of months ago. And I've seen people talk about everything from zombies and ghosts to ghosts and vampires. If there is anywhere that will listen and know my story is true... It is here with you guys. I should explain. My husband Jeff and I headed out into the wilderness. I probably shouldn't say exactly where because I really don't want this to happen to someone else. It's better to let it stay here with Jeff and me. But it is a very beautiful and remote patch of forest that extends for many miles. It is a very large place and does see visitors ever so often. But the seclusion of it is one thing Jeff and I both love. We had been planning this trip for months and were seriously excited that it was finally time to go. We had everything you can imagine for camping for a full two weeks out here in the beautiful wilderness. Rain, proof tent, dishes, cookware, food, water. We were ready for roasting marshmallows and hot dogs over the open fire, hiking and admiring the beauty all around us. Yes, I'm aware that this makes me seem like a hippie, and maybe I am a little bit, but I really love the outdoors, especially the woods. Anyway, Jeff and I had planned this right down to every last detail and were ready for the perfect tranquil and rejuvenating camping trip. That isn't what we got, though. Two days in, we got caught in a huge thunderstorm and had to hunker down inside our tent while the wind and rain beat so loudly against the sides and top of our little rain, proof tent that we thought we might be blown away. Just as quickly as it came, it was over, and the sun started shining again. If you've ever lived in or visited Kentucky for any amount of time, you know what I mean when I say that this was seriously just typical Kentucky weather. It's kind of our thing, I guess. One minute blaring storm, next sunshine, and birds singing. After that nice little downpour, every bit of our gathered firewood was soaked, and they weren't drying up any time soon. Jeff went to find more wood, and I decided to stay behind and clean out the fire pit so it would actually burn the wood Jeff brought back. It was starting to get dark, and if we didn't have a fire, we would be cold and unprotected. I had gotten it suitably ready when Jeff came flying out of the ever-darkening woods. He did not have any firewood. I was a little upset by this since it was already nearly completely dark. Jeff, what the... is all I was able to get out before Jeff was at me throwing one arm around me and one over my mouth. I was terrified at this point. What was this? Why was he doing this to me? But I could hear him mumbling. Oh, F. Oh, F, please pardon my language, but he was mumbling that over and over in my ear. I knew what that meant, too. It was bad and about to get worse. I heard my husband's voice in my ear again. Hilly, his nickname for me, when I say run, I want you to run as fast as you can back to the car and get the hell out to here. Okay, I was terrified at this point. What the hell had he seen, and was it coming for him? I moved his hand off my mouth and stated, I'm not just going to run off and leave you, Jeff, and you know that. I've seen my husband scared only once in the 15 years I've known him. It was right after his father had a heart attack and they didn't think he was going to make it. Jeff and his brother Dean paced the floor back and forth once I went to stop Jeff to try to comfort him, but when I caught his eye, my heart broke 
I grabbed him and held on as tightly as I could until his silent sobbing finally subsided. The look I saw when I caught his eye this time was so much worse than the last one. He was terrified of losing his father, but this was like he had reached a new level of fear. Before I could ask him anything else, we heard this god-awful roar. I mean, this thing could have shaken houses. It was the most terrifying and unexplainable sound I have ever heard. Jeff grabbed me, kissed my forehead, and told me to run. I didn't obey. I probably should have, considering how things turned out, but it's done. Not two seconds later, this monstrosity of a creature comes barreling into our camp and within view. I am a little embarrassed to say that I screamed like a little girl. I think most people would have. This thing is so hard to describe, but I'm going to try my best. This thing was at least nine feet tall, maybe taller. Either way, he was big. What really threw me off, though, wasn't how high he stood over me. It was how skinny he was. I can't describe to you how skinny he was. It was like he had never eaten in his life, like skin simply draped over bones. His bones rippled through his gangly leathered skin. It looked like giant worms wriggling as he moved. His arms were almost as long as he was tall. They could stretch much farther than a typical man could, and he sort of looked like he just rose from the hell of the earth. He had a large head that looked like that of a deer, only a psychotic evil deer from Satan. His nose elongated and dripped with white foamy drool. Just like a deer, he had long knotty horns that branched from the tip of his skull. That leathery looking skin was grayed and patchy with what appeared to have been hair at one time, with his hands and feet sprouting out what looked like weeds, like a big pile of hay had been stuffed up his sleeves. If he had had any, I might have been more relieved. The creature stood, watching for a moment, taking us in as we did him. I was terrified. I had never seen anything like that before. The scariest thing I have ever encountered in the woods was a wolf, but luckily it was alone and didn't appear to be hungry, so he just turned and jaunted off. This thing was quite the opposite. He looked hungry and determined. I started to scream uncontrollably. Apparently it didn't like that. He let out a roar at us, blowing that foul-smelling drool all over us. That sounded like everything you can think of dying and screaming in their death all at once. He then extended one of his giant arms and smacked me with it, grabbing Jeff before I could even get back up. I heard a rumbling sound as he pulled my husband closer to him. I realized with horror that rumbling was of hunger. Jeff was gone in an instant. The creature snapped his head off like a doll and swallowed in one quick gulp. He began just biting into Jeff's body like he was some kind of sandwich or something. The crunching was the worst. Trust me, it is a horrid sound. No one ever needs to hear. I threw up, screamed, and then remembered that Jeff had told me to run. I was too late, though, because just as I was pulling myself, painfully, I might add, out of the brush pile I had landed in, the monster was done with Jeff. Just like that, the man I knew for 15 years, the man I called my husband for 14 years, was just gone, but then he came back. The monster taunted me by becoming reflective. As he moved, a facade of Jeff took his place. I could see my husband like he had become him, but I could see through it, too, to the monster behind the disguise as well. Perhaps it was because I saw the monster before he changed. I don't know, whatever the case may be, that thing can take the form of people it has killed and eaten, or at least. That's my best guess. I finally freed myself from the brush and took off, full speed ahead toward the direction of the car, my husband's melodic voice filling my mind, my ears, my very core, beckoning me back. He was so convincing that I almost turned back. I fell into a huge hole. I think it was a trap. I just don't know if it was a trap from people for that monster or a trap built by the monster to catch people. Either way, I fell at least 20 feet, and my leg is broken in three places. I can't even move it. I'm going nowhere. I'm sitting here writing this now because I can still hear my husband's voice calling for me. And sometimes the monster's roar. 
He is looking for me, but he thankfully went the wrong way. I know what's going to happen, though. He'll be back shortly, and he will kill me, and then he will steal my face. So please, if you ever find this, anyone, get out of these woods now. And don't come looking for me. I am dead, we both are, and some horrible monster is wearing our faces so he can eat you too. Mom, I love you so much, don't come looking for me. Goodbye, Helena White. Me again. I can tell you this, I'm not going back out into those woods. Quick update. Apparently you should not Google the name of the woman above. Helena White as she appears to be a porn star. When I Google my name, I get sent to a boob page. It kind of sucks. Anyway, for those of you wondering, let me try to explain it a little better. I live about a mile from where they have been logging. They are building a new road, one that is supposed to make it easier on us all to get around. Basically, they're bypassing our town. But the important part is that before they started the logging, I spent a lot of time back into those woods. I liked the solitude and atmosphere. At least I did. I don't know how I got lucky enough to find that phone, but it was in a huge pile of dirt, barely sticking out of the side. They're ripping the place apart back there. I suppose it does have to be level for a rope, though, right? I brought the phone home. Of course it was dead. I was able to charge it with an older universal charger my dad has. It was a fairly nice phone, and I thought I might be able to clean it up and give it to my little brother if I could get it working. I, I did. I went through it, and I came across this message in a notepad app. I have absolutely no idea who this woman is, nor did I know that there is a porn star with the same name. Lol. Sorry about that. As for the monster she keeps talking about, I don't want to have a single clue. I have never seen or heard about anything like that around here. Our campfire stories and old legends are pretty much the goat man and Bigfoot, so your guess is as goose as mine. I thought of a wendigo and a skinwalker, but there have never been any stories of anything like that around here that I know of. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.